Welcome to the third session of UGBS 301. My name is Charles Jemfio Fori, and I'll be taking you through this session. And in this session, we would want to learn more about linear programming. In the previous session, you learned how to solve simultaneous equations using matrices, most using matrices, and then the row, elementary row operations in matrices. Now today, we want to look this session, we want to look at linear programming. And linear programming is just a mathematical tool which is being used to analyze many real world business problems. Particularly, we are interested in one, either maximizing our profit or revenue, or two, minimizing our cost. This is subject to some constraints, as you will see later as the course goes on. And you will try to use mathematical algorithms or mathematical steps to maximize our profit or to minimize our cost, subject to the constraints that we may face. Now, at the end of this session, we should be able to model mathematically a linear programming problem. You should be able to solve this problem using the graphical method. You should be able to convert linear programming models into the standard form. And you should be able to understand what slack and then surplus variables are. So, in our model building, in our mathematical model building, we would encounter certain words. Now, these words would have mathematical connotations. For example, if you have, for example, if you encounter words like must be, shall be, equal to, then you're going to represent them using the equal to symbol. Also, if you encounter words like less than or equal to, at most, must not exceed, not more than, then you're going to represent them using the less than or equal to symbol. Similarly, if you encounter words such as greater than or equal to, at least, then these will be represented with the greater than or equal to symbol. Now, if y lies between x and z, then this means that z is greater than x, y is greater than x, and then x is also less than y. For example, let's look at these words. The number of products produced must not exceed 1,000. If we say the number of products produced must not exceed 1,000, then it means that if x is the amount of product produced, then x is less or equal to 1,000. Also, if we say that x and y must not exceed a certain value, k, that means the addition of x and y, that is x plus y, should be less than or equal to k. And also, if we say that pressure applied must be between 1,000 and then 200, sorry, 100 and then 200 milliliters, and if x is the pressure applied, then it means that x will be less than, will be greater than 100, and then x would also be less than 200. We are going to use these mathematical connotations in most of our linear programming problems when it comes to formulation, especially with regards to the constraints. Let's take an example to see how best we can formulate this problem as a linear programming problem. So, linear programming is defined as an optimization model and it's made up of two key things. One, we have an objective function, which is linear, and also we have a set of constraints, which is also linear. So by way of example, we have Gapetto Wood Carving Incorporated manufactures two types of wooden toys, soldiers and trains. A soldier sells for three CDs, and a train sells for two CDs. The manufacturer of wooden soldiers and trains requires that two types of skilled labor will be used, that is carpentry and then finishing. A soldier requires two hours of finishing labor and then one hour of carpentry labor. A train requires one hour of finishing and then one hour of carpentry. Each week, Gapetto can obtain all the needed raw materials, but only 100 finishing hours 
and 80 carpentry hours. If at most 40 soldiers are brought each week and Gapetto expects to maximize weekly profits, then formulate a mathematical model for Gapetto's solution that can be used to maximize his weekly profit. So we have a story about somebody who produces two wedding toys, that is soldiers and trains. The resources or the manufacturing of these things requires that part of his resource will be time for carpentry and then time for finishing. Based on the constraint that we have for both carpentry and finishing, we still want to know how many of these wooden toys to produce, that is how many soldiers to produce and how many trains to produce in order to maximize our profit. We can put our story in a tabular form and this is what you get. So you see that we have the soldiers and then the trains which you would later know them to be no, you know, later find them to be known as your decision variables. These decision variables are the number of items to produce in order to maximize your profits. So our decision variables here are the soldiers and the trains. And then our resources here are the finishing time and then the time used for carpentry. So as you could see from the question, a soldier requires that we use two hours for finishing, a train requires that we use one hour for finishing, and we have 100 hours of finishing time available per week. A soldier requires one hour for carpentry, and then a train requires one hour for carpentry. We also have 80 hours of time available per week for carpentry. Lastly, you realize that a train, a soldier will go for $3, and a train would also go for $2. So based on this information, we are supposed to make a decision of the levels of these two products that would maximize Gapetto's weekly profit. In other words, we want to find out how many of the soldiers do we need to produce and how many of the trains we need to produce in order to maximize the profit. Okay, in formulating a linear programming problem, or in formulating the model, we have three basic steps that you have to go through. Now, the first thing you need to do is to identify your decision variables. These decision variables are the levels of activity. For instance, what is x1 and then what is x2? For this question, if I say x1, that it means I'm looking for the number of soldiers that I need to produce per week. So if X1 is say four, then it means that I need to produce four soldiers. If X2 is say five, then I need to produce five trains. Therefore, X2 is the number of trains that you need to produce per week. The second step in formulating a linear programming model is to identify or form the objective function. The objective function actually is a mathematical function which represents the firm's objective. It could be profit or it could be a cost. Now, in this example, our objective is to maximize our profit. So, as you can see, the total objective value is being represented by a certain variable called z and it is a combination of the amount we would get when we sell the soldiers and then the total amount we would get when we sell the trains. So, if one soldier goes for $3, then it means that if I sell X1 amount of soldiers, my total profit for the soldiers will be three times X1. Likewise, if one train should go for $2, and I sell X2 amount of trains, then it means that the total number of trains that I need to sell, or the total profit from selling X2 number of trains will be 2X2. Therefore, my overall profit of selling trains and then soldiers is going to be the profit you get from soldiers plus the profit you get from trains, which is 3X1 plus 2X2.
The third step is to look at the resource constraints. Now you're going to take this one after the other. From the question, we could see that there are three main restrictions that were placed on the firm. The first restriction was related to the available hours that is needed for finishing. If you have 100 hours for finishing, it means that we can't go beyond 100 hours. That means you are restricted to work within a resource, um, a resource allocation of 100 hours per week for finishing. You are also restricted to work within a resource allocation of 80 hours per week for carpentry work. You are also restricted to produce at most 40 soldiers. So for the first constraint, you could see that 2x1 plus x2 is less or equal to 100. In other words, if it takes you two hours of finishing for a soldier, and then one hour of finishing for a train, it means that every train will require two hours of finishing. That means that if I produce x1 number of trains, then my model is going to be two times x1, because each train needs two hours of finishing. Each soldier needs two hours of finishing. Likewise, each train also requires one hour of finishing. Therefore, we have something like 1x2. And because we have the coefficient of 1, we don't necessarily have to bring the 1. That's why you see the x2 standing alone. We also have an available time of 100 hours. And it means that, therefore, 2x1 plus x2 should be less or equal to 100 for the finishing time. Also, we see that. For the carpentry time, we have x1 plus x2 less or equal to 80. And this is because we have one hour for carpentry work for a soldier, and then one hour for carpentry work for a train. And we have 80 available hours. And because we have 80 available hours and we can't go beyond 80 hours, we use the less than or equal to inequality. Now, if you go back to the question, we said that at most 40 soldiers are bought each week. At most 40 soldiers are bought each week. Now this tells us that the number of soldiers to be produced each week cannot exceed 40. And that is why we have x1 less than or equal to 40. This is a summary of our resource constraints. The last thing that you need to consider is what we call the non-negativity constraint. And this non-negativity constraint is actually part of the constraint, which tells us that our decision variables cannot be negative. Of course, if you're into production, you can't have produce negative five soldiers or negative five trains or negative 10 trains. All the number of soldiers or trains that we are required to produce can either be positive or the list will be zero. Therefore, we restrict our decision variables to take only positive values. So we have that x1 will be greater than or equal to zero, and the next two will be greater than or equal to zero. So we have a summary of our problem formulation. The objective value of the objective value of the objective function is such that we have z or we are maximizing z equals to 3x1 plus 2x2 and is subject to the following constraints 2x1 plus x2 less or equal to 100 for the capping for the finishing hours x1 plus x2 less or equal to 80 for the carpentry time x1 is less or equal to 40 for the restrictions placed on the manufacture of soldiers, and also x1 greater than or equal to 0, x2 greater than or equal to 0, which represents the non-negativity constraint. So this is a summary of the linear programming formulation or the linear programming model. Now, when all the resources are used, 
and all the constraints are in equality form, then we say that our linear programming is in the standard form. Now, if you go back and you check, you see that in this, you don't have a standard form here because you have all our constraints having one inequality or the other. Now, if you look at this, we see that all the inequalities have been converted into equalities. To convert from an inequality to, e to equality, we form what we call slug variables for less than or equal to constraints, and then surplus variables for greater than or equal to constraints. Slug variables are basically an unused resource. For example, if we are required to use 100 hours of finishing time, and we use only 90 hours for finishing, then it means that we have an unused resource of what? 10 hours. Therefore, it means you have the number of periods used in finishing, which in our case is say 90, plus the unused resource, which in our case you will say is 10, should add up and give you the total finishing time that is allocated to you. Therefore, for less than or equal to constraints, we add a slack variable, and a slack variable just represents the amount of unused variables. In case your constraint is a greater than or equal to one, you subtract what we call a surplus variable. Surplus variables are excess over the minimum requirements. For example, take that you require to score an 80 in your examination to get an A, and you get 90. This means that you have an excess of 10 marks. Therefore, for your marks to, to, to have an equal to value between your marks and then the minimum requirements, the 90 that you scored minus the 10 should give you 80. In this case, you are subtracting a surplus, but if it is a less than or equal to, you'll be adding a slack. So, there are certain assumptions that you'd have to take into consideration. One, that the objective function, the contribution of the objective function from each decision variable is proportional to the value of the decision variable. Secondly, the contribution to the objective function for any variable is independent of the values of the other decision variables. Since, so we have this as our linear programming model. Now the main question is, once we've formulated, how then do we solve this model? There are various ways to solve a linear programming problem. We have the graphical solution, we can have the simplex method, we can have the computer solution, but in this session, we'll focus on the graphical solution. So you want to find the values of x1 and x2 that will meet all these constraints and which would also maximize this linear programming formulation that we've made. We talk of feasible and optimal solutions. If you have a feasible solution or a feasible region, it's the set of all points that satisfies the linear programming constraints and then sign restrictions. So for instance, any point of x1 and x2 that I get, that will satisfy constraint one, constraint two, constraint three, is a feasible solution. However, for a maximization problem, an optimal solution is a point with the largest objective function value. Therefore, we could say that an optimal solution is also a feasible solution, or an optimal solution is also part of a feasible region. But in maximization, a solution is optimal if it maximizes our objective. So if we put the values of x1 and x2 into the objective function, the largest will be our optimal solution. The ones that give you the largest value of z will be our optimal solution for a maximization problem. Similarly, for a minimization problem, if we put in the values of x1 and x2 
for the feasible points, the one that will return the smallest value of z will be our optimal solution. So our quest here is to look for some feasible solutions and then pick an optimal solution which will either maximize our profit or minimize our cost. We will move on to how to use the graphical solution to solve this linear programming problem that we have. So, in the previous session, we learned how to draw lines of inequality, and we are going to use that idea to actually solve this problem using the graphical method. Now, we are going to take each constraint one after the other, and we are going to plot lines over them. So, let's take the first constraint. 2x1 plus x2 less than or equal to 100. If you come back to this line, you see that we learned how to plot these lines. So, I believe that you will be able to plot these lines as time goes on. So, the line that stretches from 100 down to 50 is our equation 2x1 plus x2 less than or equal to. The line that stretches from 100 to 50 is our equation 2x1 plus x2 is equal to 100. In the previous session, we learned that if it is greater, any point that is greater than the value of the line, greater than will point to the right side of the line, whereas less than points to the left side of the line. Therefore, our inequality here is 2x1 plus x2 less than or equal to 100. It tells you that the arrow is pointing to the left side of the line. Therefore, our solution lies to the left side of the line. Similarly, the second line you can see here is the line x1 plus x2 less than or equal to 80. x1 plus x2 less than or equal to 80. And given this line, when you draw this line, you will see that we point the solution also to the left of the line because of the inequality less than or equal to. Likewise, we also have this straight line or this vertical line that is also giving us the line x1 is less than or equal to 40. The line crosses the x1 axis at point 40. And because it is a less than or equal to, that also points to the left of the line. Therefore, we have three lines. The first, the first, sorry, we have three lines, the first line, the second line, and then the third line. And we all have areas that are common to these lines. A feasible point is an area which is common to the line one, line two, and then the line three. So as indicated in this shaded area, we are saying that the feasible points, these points are feasible. Any point that lies within this area is a feasible point because they are common to the first line, they are common to the second line, and then they are also common to the third line. So by way of summary, we say that any point in the shaded region is a feasible solution but it is not necessarily an optimal solution. To test for the optimal solution, we would have to look at all the corner points and pick the one that yields the maximum value of the objective function. When I say all the corner points, we mean that if from this point to that point, then down to this point, down to that point, and then down here, contains the boundaries of our feasible region, then the corner points are such that point H is a corner point, point D is a corner point, point G is a corner point, point F is a corner point, and similarly, point E is also a corner point. The theorem of linear programming tells us that if you look, if you have a feasible region, then, and it's bounded by a line or curve or anything, then the corner points would contain the optimal, any of the corner points will contain an optimal solution. So, 
instead of testing the millions of points that are lying within this feasible region, we are just going to look at the corner points here to get an optimal solution. So, as you can see, if you look at point H, point H is the point where X1 is 0 and then X2 is 0. If you look at point D, we have the point where X1 is 0 and then X2 is 80. So we have 0, 0 for point H. We have 0, 80 for point D. If you come to G, G will be identified by stretching down this line downwards to touch the X1 axis and stretching it across to touch the X2 axis. Therefore, we have, if you come down, we have X1 being equal to about 20, and then we have X2 being equal to about 60. Now, if you draw this graph to scale, you could easily see what you are talking about when you scale down and then you scale across. If you don't draw to scale, you can still find the exact value of this point by solving these two lines simultaneously. And I believe you are familiar with simultaneous equations. So point G is giving us 20 for x1 and then 60 for x2. If we come to point F, if you come down here, you see that F, the x1 coordinate of F is 40. And then the x2 coordinate of f is also 20. You can also find this by solving the lines x1 equals to 40, and then the lines x1 plus 2x, 2x1 plus x2 equals to 100 simultaneously. You would get the values. So we have 40 for x1 and then 20 for x2. Then lastly, point E gives us 0 for x, for x2 and then 40 for x1. So we have 40, 0. That means that we have a total of, say, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 5 feasible solution areas. And we believe that one of these areas would maximize our objective function. What we just have to do is to put each of these points into the objective function. Whichever that returns the maximum value is the point that maximizes our profit. So if we take point 00, zero given that our objective function is 3x1 plus 2x2, it means that our total objective profit or total profit for at the point 00, zero will be 3 times 0 plus 2 times 0 which of course will return the answer zero. We go to the point 0, 080, and we see that we have z equals to three times zero, that means x1 is zero, plus two times the value of x2, which is 80 in this case, and therefore we have 160. If you go to the third point, it is 40, zero. That means that we are going to have three times 40, plus 2 times 0, which will give us 120. And then we go to the next one, 40, 20, which returns 160. And then the last one, x1, 20, x2, 60, will return a value of 160. Now, if you look at these values, these feasible values, you see that the largest value of z here is x equals to 180. Therefore, you will say that subject to the constraints that we have, and then our objective of maximizing our profit, the maximum profit would occur at x1 equals to 20, and x2 equals to 100, sorry, x2 equals to 60. And this will give us a total profit of 180 dollars. So we would say that for our wood cover to maximize his profits, he needs to produce 20 of the soldiers and then 60 pieces of the trains. Subject to all of those constraints, he would maximize his profits.
Okay. We look at what we call binding and non-binding constraints. If all your resources are used, then we have a binding constraint. In other words, a constraint is binding if the left-hand side and then the right-hand side of the constraints are equal when the optimal values of the decision variables are substituted into the constraints. Let's go back to our constraints we had. You saw that we have the first constraint is 2x1 plus x2 less than or equal to 100. Our objective or our optimal solution was x1 equals to 20 and then x2 equals to 60. Now let's put these values into this constraint. So we have 2 times 20, that gives us 40, and then plus 60. So we have 40 plus 60, which is also 100. So whatever value we have at the right-hand side is 100, and then the value we also have at the left-hand side is also 100. And therefore, it means that the finishing constraint is binding. It's binding because 1, the left-hand side value is equal to the right-hand side value, or there are no unused resources left. Similarly, for the carpentry constraints, x1 is 20, x2 is 60, so 20 plus 60 will give us 80, and therefore whatever we have at the left-hand side is the same as whatever we have at the right-hand side. This also makes the finishing constraints binding, and then the carpentry constraint also binding. But when you come to the third constraint, you see that the value of x1 was 20, and 20 is not equal to 40. 20 is less than or equal to 40, and therefore, the third constraint is not binding, because the left-hand side values and then the right-hand side values are not the same. So, we have that finishing constraint is binding because left-hand side is equal to right-hand side. Carpentry constraint is also binding because left-hand side is equal to right-hand side. But the demand or the constraint that was placed on the restriction on manufacturing is not binding because we had x1 to be 20 and 20 is not equal to 40. In as much as we have a maximization problem in linear programming, we could also have a minimization problem. Looking at this work, this is a, a formulation that has already a problem that has already been formulated. And it's such that we are supposed to minimize z, which is equal to 50x1 plus 100x2. Now, this minimization model could be in terms of cost and Nobody would like to maximize his cost and minimize his or a profit or revenue, but we always want to have work in a way where cost is as minimum as possible. Therefore, in minimization models, you have minimized Z, which is equal to 50x1 plus 100x2, and it's subject to these constraints. Now, these constraints are greater than or equal to constraints, which are mostly requirements that we need to meet just as we saw in the maximization problem. So, in doing so, we also have another graphical solution for the minimization problem. And you see that if you draw this line, because the line 7x1 plus 2x2 is less than, is greater than or equal to 28, the solution will point to the right of the line. Similarly, since 2x1 plus 12x2 is greater than or equal to 24, the solution also points to the right. And therefore, our feasible solution is no longer this unshaded portion, as we saw a similar in the case of the maximization. But it's this entire portion which is shaded in the case of this minimization model. Over here, too, we can locate corner points, and our corner points are such that we have point E being one corner point, point C being another corner point that is 0, 12, that's 12 for x1 and then 0 for x2, and also point B 
being on that po corner point, which is 0 for x1 and then 14 for x2. In identifying, in identifying an optimal solution for the minimization problem, we expect that if you put each of these points into the model or into the objective function, the one that will give you the least value is the minimum cost. So far, we've looked at how to use the graphical solution to solve this simple linear programming problem. In our next session, we will show you how to use the computer, the computer that is the Excel to solve these linear programming problems. We will see you in the next session. Thank you.